This is the 15th video supplement for CIS 351, Grand Valley State University's course on computer organization and assembly language. This video discusses the carry lookahead adder. In the previous videos, we built a ripple carry adder and then determined that both the size and time of the circuits designed using this pattern grow linearly as the number of input bits increases. And then we finished by wondering if we can do better. Well, let's start with the size. Can we design an adder whose size grows slower than big O of n? Well, no. For the adder to grow slower than big O of n, we would need to be able to add input bits without adding gates, or without making the existing gates bigger. Another way of looking at this is that each bit of input needs at least one unique two-input gate. If there is an input that doesn't have at minimum its own unique two-input gate, then it's not really contributing to the output. And we know from the way adders work that all the bits do affect the output. So big O of n is the best we can do. Fortunately, the problem of reducing the propagation delay is a little more interesting. To see how we can improve this speed, we begin by asking, where's the bottleneck? Or in other words, what's the key aspect of this design that makes the time linear? It's the chain of carries. Each full adder has to wait for all the full adders before it to complete before it can begin working. Ideally, though, we'd like all the full adders to work completely in parallel. To do that, we'd also need to be able to generate the carry ins in parallel as well. Or, if not in parallel, we at least need to be able to generate those carry ins in sublinear time. Okay, so let's sketch this idea of having all of these carry ins in parallel like this. This diagram replaces the yellow chain of carries with these little green boxes. Each green box determines a carry in directly from the inputs. Notice specifically that each green box has access to all eight input bits from both input A and input B. Now let's think about how to implement these little green boxes. We'll begin with the most significant carry in, which we'll call C7. We call it C7 because it's the carry in to column number 7. Now think about the different situations in which C7 will be true. One case is when both bits from the previous column are 1's. In this case, there'll be a carry in to column 7 regardless of what any of the other input bits are. So C7 is true whenever A6 and B6 are both true. Well, what else? What other situations would produce a carry out of column 6 and into column 7? Let's suppose only one of the input bits for column 6 is a 1. In this case, whether there's a carry depends on the carry from the previous column, the carry into column 6. So C7 is also true if either A6 or B6 is true and there's a carry into column 6. At this point, we have a recursive formula for the carry into any given column. If we were to unwind this recursion and implement it directly, we'd end up with effectively the same big O of n pattern that's in the ripple carry adder. But if we develop a non-recursive version of this formula, we'll come out ahead. All right, to more easily understand this formula, both the recursive version here and the non-recursive version we're going to build, let's classify the columns into three groups. If both inputs in a column are ones, we say that that column generates a carry. We say it generates a carry because there will always be a carry out of this column. So in some sense, columns like this create or generate a new carry. If a column has a single one, we say that that column propagates a carry. It doesn't generate or create a new carry, but if there's a carry into the column, the column will pass it on or propagate it into the next column. Finally, if both inputs are zeros, we say that that column swallows the carry because there will never be a carry out even if there's a carry in. So in this context, what must happen in order for there to be a carry into column 7? Well, at a high level, two things must happen. First, some column to the right must generate a carry, and then all of the columns between must propagate that carry. So let's see some examples. So as we already saw, there's a carry into column 7 if column 6 generates a carry. 
There's also a carry into column 7 if column 5 generates the carry and column 6 propagates it. Similarly, we could have column 4 generate the carry and columns 5 and 6 propagate it. Or we could have column 3 generate the carry and then columns 4, 5, and 6 each propagate it. If we continue this pattern, we get this formula, which is certainly not easy to follow. So let's clean it up a bit. First, we'll define G sub n to be a n and b n. G in this case stands for generate. And we make this substitution because when both a n and b n are true, it means that column generates a carry. Defining g n this way allows us to clean up the formula a little bit because we can replace a5 b5 with g5 and we can replace a4 b4 with g4 and so on. Similarly, we'll define p sub n to be a sub n or b sub n. In this case, p stands for propagate. When either a n or b n is true, it means that column is propagating a carry. So we can further clean up this formula by replacing, for example, a6 b6 with p6 and replace a5 b5 with p5 and so on. When we make all of these substitutions, our formula is still long, but it's much more manageable. I think it's a little easier to see what's happening when we look at how the circuit is implemented. Now, just a quick explanation, this notation here is called a named wire. The names show points in the circuit that are connected, but without showing the actual wires. Named wires are typically used when showing the wires would make the circuit harder to understand rather than easier. For example, this is what happened when I tried to replace the named wires with actual physical wires. I got about halfway through and ran out of room and the diagram just got cluttered. Those extra wires really don't provide any intuition about how the circuit works and they make it harder to follow. So let's go back to the version with the named wires and see how this circuit works. This set of AND gates determines which columns generate a carry. Right, this is just the AND gate for all the GNs. Similarly, this set of OR gates determines which columns propagate carries. These are just the OR gates for all the PNs. The key part of this algorithm is done by these AND gates here. These gates determine whether a generated carry is propagated all the way to the left. For example, let's focus on this specific AND gate. It returns true if column 2 generates a carry and then columns 3, 4, 5, and 6 all propagate it. And then the OR gate at the end tells us if any of the generated carries are propagated all the way to the end, thereby creating a carry into the particular column. Each of the green boxes in this diagram contains a subcircuit that follows the pattern we just looked at. This specific circuit is C7. The circuits for the other boxes follow the same pattern, but they get smaller as you move to the right because there are fewer columns that must be examined. In other words, there are fewer AND gates and OR gates, and the rightmost AND gates have fewer inputs. Notice that each of these green carry-in subcircuits depend only on the inputs A and B. That means they can all run in parallel, and all of the full adders below can run in parallel. Therefore, the overall propagation delay of this circuit depends primarily on the propagation delay of these green carry-in circuits. As we saw in the last video, the full adders below all have a constant propagation delay. So let's figure out the propagation delay for this carry-in circuit family. First, remember that the farther left you go, the bigger the carry-in logic gets because you have more columns to consider. For example, the carry logic for column 3 only needs to consider the inputs for columns 0, 1, and 2, but the carry logic for column 7 must consider the inputs for all six preceding columns. This means that as we move left, the number of gates in each column increases. Furthermore, the size of the biggest AND gate also increases. So with that in mind, how exactly does the propagation delay for this circuit grow as N grows? First, notice that all of the generate and propagate gates run in parallel. They all just depend directly on the input A and B. Therefore, they contribute at most one gate delay or a big O of one, a constant amount of time. Next, all of these gates also run in parallel. They all depend solely on the generate and propagate gates. 
The largest of these AND gates has about N inputs. Therefore, the time for this gate and the whole column, as a matter of fact, is big O of log N. Similarly, the OR gate has N inputs and a time of big O of log N. You put that all together and you see that the overall time for the leftmost carry logic is big O of log N. Now, because this is the slowest piece of all the components that run in parallel, when you put this together, you get an overall propagation delay that grows logarithmically. Now, as you know, you almost never get something for nothing. So do you have any guesses about what we give up in order to get the faster speed in this adder? We pay for this extra speed with size. The carry look ahead adder is much bigger than the corresponding ripple carry adder. So let's look at the size of this carry look ahead logic. First, there is one generate and one propagate gate for each bit of input. And this contributes a total of big O of N gates. The largest AND gate in the largest carry in block has big O of N inputs. Video 14 shows us then that if we build this out of two input gates as a tree, its size is big O of N. Now there are big O of N gates in this group, so when we combine those two, we get a total size of big O of N squared, giving a total size for this subcircuit that's big O of N squared. Now, since there are N of these carry in subcircuits, each of which is big O of N squared, we get a total size of big O of N cubed. Now I'm hearing some objections that N cubed is way too big. After all, these AND gates get smaller as you move down the column, where the last AND gate only has two inputs. And likewise, the carry-in logic gets smaller as you move left to right, where the rightmost carry-in logic only has four gates in it total. So common sense should say that this shouldn't be that bad, right? All of those small components have to help us out somehow. Well, not exactly. Do you remember analyzing this particular code pattern when you first learned big O? This nested loop where the inner loop starts at the outer loop's index? This is just the fundamental pattern inside the selection sort. The first time this inner loop runs, it runs n minus one times, and then the next time it's n minus two, and then it's n minus three, and so on, all the way down until it only runs one time. When you reverse this sequence, you're just adding up all the numbers from one to n minus one. And so if you'll remember, the formula for that is just n minus one times n over two, or n squared minus n over two. So that is less than n squared, but it's still big O of n squared. It just differs by a constant. That same mathematical reasoning applies to the carry look ahead subcircuit where although the AND gates keep getting smaller and the carry look ahead circuits themselves keep getting smaller, if you were to write a doubly nested loop to count all that up, you would still get a value that is big O of N cubed. It would be smaller than N cubed, it'd be like one sixth N cubed, but still big O of N cubed. So one last thing. I'm gonna save the specific details for a future video, but let me quickly point out that you can combine aspects of both the ripple carry and the carry look ahead adder to find a good balance between size and speed. For example, we could put carry logic on only half of the full adders. Doing so would cut the size of the circuit by about half because most of the gates are in that carry logic, but doing so would only increase the propagation delay by a little bit, just the propagation delay of one full adder. Similarly, we could put just one carry circuit in the middle and this would cut our time in about half as compared to a ripple carry adder because the left half and the right half would work more or less in parallel, but then we'd only have the extra size of that one carry circuit instead of all eight. I'll explain more about this in a future video. So based on this video, you should be able to sketch the carry in logic that the carry look ahead adder uses and be able to explain how this look ahead logic works. You should also be able to explain why the adder as designed in this video that has a propagation delay that grows logarithmically and a size that grows cubically. In the next video, we'll look at a different approach to avoid the ripple carry. And then video 17 will look more closely at the trade-offs between size and time and how we can combine the different designs to make the adder fast enough without letting it grow too large.